Hostiles, 12 o'clock and 6 miles. What is this tack they're looking for anyway? It's some kind of weapon left by the ancients. The kind that decides who wins the war. Have Moloch's warriors been here before? I don't like the look of this. That was above and beyond. Isn't the Lambda site off-world, sir? I'd like to briefly take a moment and say thank you to everyone who has continued to join us over the Florida Maquis Patreon channel. The Holy Bible teaches us, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. If you'd like to join us over there, it's only one U.S. dollar per month at the base level, and even less than that if you sign up for an entire year, and no matter what level you choose, it's fully refundable. First 90 days, no questions asked. What's the difference between YouTube and Patreon? At Patreon, we can take the gloves off. There are no sensors. We have, of course, the Patreon firewall, and then we also have Vimeo that we're partnering with, and that gives us one extra layer of protection where we can speak our minds and we can take advantage of rights that we used to enjoy in this country freely. would love to have you over there. There are hundreds of of exclusive videos never before seen here on YouTube. Please, if you have the ability, would love to have you over there. You won't regret it. God bless all of you, and thank you so much. The vast majority of the finds that I uncover in Antarctica, I have yet to share with my audience. I know a lot of people would be surprised to hear that, given how many videos we've done. Unless I can make a compelling argument for what I believe it to be and be able to articulate that, I can't really do a video about it. There's something going on down there that is hard to describe. And I'm going to attempt to do it today and hope that it comes through. It has to do with the age of exploration. Late 13th century, 14th century, man coming out of the era of the Black Death and um, the invention of the printing press allowed ideas to um, promulgate more quickly, we began to explore the world, build ships and just send them over the horizon, so to speak. Now, it wasn't out of just simple curiosity. That was part of it. People were looking to get wealthy. People were looking to bring back riches. There were a lot of reasons why, but one specific reason gave people the ability to do it in an effective way. It was the invention of a ship called the Caravel. The Caravel was one of the first ships that allowed you to sail directly into the wind. That wasn't available before, and the way the winds worked off of the west coast of Great Britain and Spain, it was very, very difficult to travel to the New World. Once These were the ships that Columbus took the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria. Now, I know there were other ships as well that had arrived through different means and different parts of the New World, but this was the beginning. This gave, I don't want to say the average person, but the average person that had the wherewithal to explore could say, okay, we can make a feasible plan to go to this new place in search of wealth. I think that's what's going on now with Antarctica. There's something happening down there that makes it more financially feasible. I truly, honestly believe on the continent right now, whether it was carved out of the ice 
or whether something was discovered under the ice, there are factories. And I know that's a big statement to say, factories. How could I prove such a thing? Well, there is one thing that the Chinese and the Norwegians and the Nordic peoples have in common. They were exploring the world. They were uh, moving around the globe on ships far earlier than the Portuguese were. For one reason, whaling. Whales are a huge source, resource perhaps is a better word. So many things can be um, extracted from the body of a whale. And we know now in modern times they're protected because the northern uh, hemisphere had been so denuded of that resource. They have only one place left where there are still large enough populations of whales to conduct it. And that's the southern hemisphere. I really, really honestly think that... And I brought up this picture to show you what happened in Europe once it got going. There was this huge trade. It's called the Columbian Exchange. And many things were brought from Europe to North America and vice versa. I think this is going to be something that we're going to see with Antarctica. And of course, one of the reasons that here off the coast of Florida, the Caribbean, the seafloor is just littered with gold has to do with the desire of the Spanish to bring back wealth from the New World. This is the part of this story that I have a hard time communicating to my audience. There is a different kind of gold to be found in Antarctica. And it has to do with the whales. This was found on a beach in Thailand. It's a 22-pound... Um, block or blob, I guess, of something called ambergris. It is produced in the intestinal tract of a sperm whale. Now, some say that it is vomit. Some say that it goes out the other end, and I'll just leave it that, at that. But it's worth an insane amount of money. This 22-pound hunk of this stuff netted this uh, Thai fisherman 500,000 U.S. dollars for a blob of whale vomit he found on a beach. Now, most wits very rare, but it's worth a ton of money. For years and years and years, and this is from the 40s, this is the wreck of the Governoran. It was a factory whaling ship of its day that caught fire and sank. And this was from the 40s. Now, at the end of this video, I'm going to share this uh, um, link. It's from the Museum of New Zealand, Te Papa Tonga Rewa. And it's 12 minutes, and I'll speed it up just a little bit. And it talks about um, this factory whaling ship that leaves from Southampton in England and the journey it makes to South Africa where it picks up its uh, fleet of whale hunter ships and it goes down to, to Antarctica for the season and collects these things and processes them and it shows all of the different things that you can get from whales. The images that I have shown down there look a lot like whale corpses. And I know that's a very strange thing to say, the ones that I haven't shown you, because they're giant, large, gray masses that look like they've been partially cut apart laying on the ice. And they're all right around that same area, that Mertz Ninnis Valley. And this is another article I'll share. It's from the Natural History Museum. It talks about ambergris and the different types of ambergris. And even uh, it was referred to in Moby Dick that uh, something about the, the death of a whale and how bad it smelled, but there was this faint odor of perfume, and that's what they use it to make. So let me show you what I'm talking about. This area of Antarctica right here that we have been so many times, the Mertz Ninnis Valley, it's, it's closest to Tasmania. See up here is the, the peninsula, the Antarctic Peninsula where all of the, I guess, uh, U.S. resources are and all the studies. Exact opposite of that, almost all the way down to 6 o'clock, 
near Tasmania is this area called the Mertz Nenis Valley. And there's this quiet little bay right here. And right at the edge of the bay, I talked about this in a video a long time ago, but never really got much more into it. Right at the edge of the water, you find these very strange areas that are outlined and decked out in red. And there's six or seven of them. And you got to zoom in real close to see it. And it looks like something is going on here. And this is like the, this is the beginning of the Mertz Nenis Valley. One of the things that uh, is talked about in that documentary we're going to look at at the end is the boredom. How a lot of sailors, you know, the trip just from Southampton down to where they meet their hunting vessels is 6,000 miles of sheer boredom and doing nothing. But looking around up here in the Mertz Nenis, sometimes I really wonder if the things that we've seen, like the dragon's heads and the simian profile face, and those things that look like the outlines of perhaps Norwegian um, kings from years ago is the result of bored whalers. I did a video about this before. And looking through this region, when we see things like this, it really makes me wonder if in their time, in their spare time, they've, you know, while they're waiting for things to do, once they've processed the whales, if they've taken advantage of the vast amount of whale oil that would be available, and this is the source of these fires, this red and yellow and orange, because that's what that's the reason I brought up the governor. That's what burned it down. They were done for the season. They had extracted some ridiculous twenty-two thousand gallons of whale oil it had been a record season and they decided to have a little party and somebody kicked over a a lantern and since the entire ship was pretty much coated in oil it burnt and sank you see you could avoid that here if the chinese perhaps in some type of league with the norwegians had created and this is what i'm talking about they just don't seem like they should be there. Especially up here. Where it looks like they're cutting something apart. And who knows what they could be pulling up and they could be netting fish down here just to feed the crews. And who knows what they could be bringing up in their nets. You see, this looks like something somebody created. It really does. And when you take the time to look around down here, and you'll see these very strange giant gray blobs, just what look like they're laying on top of the ice, you kind of got to wonder, because there'd be no way to enforce any kind of whaling treaty down here. And it would be a huge resource. That, you know, they could get away with anything, really. There'd be no labor laws. And that was one of the things that, uh, in the New World, why slavery was so prevalent here. See, there was no, uh, they didn't have huge slave plantations in Europe. They were able to get away with it here because it was the new world. It was a free-for-all. Why would there be anything different going on down in Antarctica? I don't think man has changed that much. But I will. I'll, uh, it's a, now, it's a 1940s presentation. So there's going to be some things said that, of course, are dated. 
but I'll go ahead and speed this up 1.25 and let you guys listen to this as we leave out here and see if you can pick out some of the things that would make sense to a modern effort to conduct whaling, secret illegal whaling. Southampton docks at dawn. A great ship looms out of the grey autumn mist. She's a whaling ship at the start of a voyage to the other end of the world, to the Antarctic Ocean. But this ship would be a strange sight to the men who manned the whaling ships in bygone days. She's a floating factory, equipped with up-to-date machinery, and a crew of 400 men, many of whom are not sailors, but factory workers. During the months at sea, these men will be busy extracting from the whales the oil and food that make them so valuable. Every year, many countries send out fleets to the wedding ground. Let's travel with one of these expeditions, leaving England early one October morning. The factory ship travels the first lap of the journey alone, 6,000 miles from Southampton to Cape Town. There, the catcher ships, which do the actual hunting of the whales, are waiting to join them. The expedition, now complete, sets its course southward for the remaining 2,000 miles to the Antarctic. As we've seen, each expedition includes a factory ship and several catcher vessels. These ships are small and speedy, built to maneuver as swiftly and suddenly as the whales they hunt. Following a long tradition, the crews come mostly from Norway. Most highly skilled of all are the harpoon gunners, whose trade is often handed down from father to son. Men have hunted the whales for over a thousand years and more. The old fishing grounds of the Northern Hemisphere are now exhausted, and only here, in the icy seas of the Antarctic, is the whale still plentiful. Here he feeds on plankton, millions of tiny plant and animal organisms which flourish in the polar seas. So here are the whaling fleets that follow, plowing on day after day through seas in which the floating ice grows thicker and tighter, piling up into great masses which bar the way to the south. The expedition now approaches the continent of Antarctica, five million square miles of icy waste, attracting only the explorer, the scientist, and the whaler. As the sturdy little ships force their bows through the ice towards the open water which lies beyond, the men aboard grow ever more eager, more impatient. The whaling grounds are confined to the regions between the South Shetland Islands and the entrance to the Ross Sea. At last, open water. Now there's no time to be lost. The catchers have to be refueled after their long journey. Men who traveled out with the factory ship transferred their own ship. All harpoons and equipment must be checked, ready for the first trip. The catchers cruise at a range of about 50 miles. From the 1st of December until the beginning of April, they'll sail and search, hoping that luck will be with them. As the catchers set out, the sea is calm, the weather fine. Everything seems set fair for a good season. The modern whale hunters have a new recruit to their fleet, the aeroplane. This is carried aboard a factory ship. The aircraft's launched from the deck by a catapult and is used for reporting weather and ice conditions ahead of the expedition. But this time, a catcher needs its help for whale spotting. On board the catcher, the lookout climbs to the crow's nest high above the deck. The gunner holds a conference on the bridge. The deckhands see that their gear runs smoothly. Ahead, the ocean seems empty, undisturbed. Suddenly, a whale breaks surface. There it is again. There she blows. A yell from the lookout directs the waiting gunner on the bridge. With his eyes on the blowing whale, he hurries along the narrow catwalk. The chase is on. The little ship can do 16 knots, but so can a blue whale on the run with his life at stake. He turns... I'm going to go ahead and stop it there. It just dawned on me that <clears throat> showing something like this might cause a problem with YouTube. So anyway, but I think you can see the idea here. What an advantage would it be if you didn't have to make that trip with that huge ship? If you could do everything down here, process all of that, and then all you would need to do is have a cargo ship come pick it up. 
or even a plane. We've heard the stories of how many different runways we that we've uh, heard the Chinese said they're they're going to be making down here. Imagine the advantage. And like I said, the whale stuff is expensive and rare. That would give it give them every, um, I guess, motivation to do it. If you can get a half a million dollars for twenty two pounds of this stuff. Just imagine the meat, the fat, the stuff made from the bone, all of that different stuff that is uh, so difficult to find but so prized in places like Norway and China. It makes sense to me anyway, but I'll leave it there. Like, share, subscribe. would like to briefly take a moment and say thank you to everyone who has continued to join us over at the Florida Maquis Patreon channel. The Holy Bible teaches us Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. If you'd like to join us over there, it's only one U.S. dollar per month at the base level, and even less than that if you sign up for an entire year, and no matter what level you choose, it's fully refundable, first 90 days, no questions asked. What's the difference between YouTube and Patreon? At Patreon, we can take the gloves off. There are no censors. We have, of course, the Patreon firewall, and then we also have Vimeo that we're partnering with, and that gives us one extra layer of protection where we can speak our minds and we can take advantage of rights that we used to enjoy in this country freely. Would love to have you over there. There are hundreds of exclusive videos never before seen here on YouTube. Please, if you have the ability, would love to have you over there. You won't regret it. God bless all of you, and thank you so much. Hot time. 12 o'clock and 6 miles. What is this tack they're looking for anyway? It's some kind of weapon left by the ancients. The kind that decides who wins the war. Have Moloch's warriors been here before? I don't like the look of this. That was above and beyond, Green King. Isn't the Landesite off-world, sir? Thank you.